I invite you this morning, if you would, to take your Bibles and look with me to Philippians chapter 2. Appreciate Jay's reading the scripture for us this morning. We will spend the majority of our time in that text of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Let's uh, join our hearts as we begin in prayer. Lord, we come to you and we acknowledge our need of you. As we look to the mind of Christ today in this uh, beautiful passage of Scripture, we are woefully aware of just how short we come of thinking as our Lord thought. So we pray, O oh God, that as, as we look at your word, that the Spirit of God might capture our hearts, our minds, our imaginations, and move us in the direction of Christ's likeness. Lord, we know that uh, we are a new people, but a new people not yet made perfect. And so we need the, uh, certainly the, the help of the Spirit of God to move us in the direction of being like, more like the Lord Jesus in the way we think, act, and respond one to another. We pray, O oh God, that again, you would be glorified as you do that work of transformation by your work and by your Spirit in the hearts and lives of these your people today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we mentioned last time together, looking in the book of Philippians, we find a whole lot of uh, attention being given to the whole idea of our minds, our attitudes. And last time together, we examined chapter 3, which helped us understand what it takes to move positively in the Christian life, the Christian experience. And as we were able to look at chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, we were able to discover that, that there's two things that are certainly important as we move in that direction. The first is that we must have an essential attitude. And as we looked at that uh, last time together, last Sunday, we were able to see that there's two key parts of, of having an essential attitude. And the first was simply a personal inventory of where you are, taking time out in your life, in your schedule, uh, just a quiet time, a time out to see exactly where you are in order to see where it is that God might want to take you. The second part of that essential attitude was simply the personal implementation of what to do. And two key parts to that was simply this. Number one, you've got to let go of the past. Very clearly, forgetting those things which are behind and stretching forth, reaching forth toward the mark for the prize, the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. So letting go of the past, laying hold of the present. And of course, as we were able to see there in chapter 3 as well, Paul says, listen, we must have sort of an engaged approach, an energetic approach uh, to the Christian life and experience, sort of like a, an athlete who's been on being the very first to break the tape. And that's the kind of uh, imagery here, the kind of... Uh, of uh, picture we have for us where he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we talked about what that looked like back in Paul's day, where a person who was certainly a, a champion on the playing field would be called up to an elevated platform and they're awarded. And of course, we think in terms of hearing one day, well done and good and faithful servant. So as we look to chapter two, we also see information and detail in respect to um, our attitude. We also see it in chapter one as well as chapter four. Perhaps uh, next week we will look into chapter four. But uh, we've entitled this message out of my mind, out of our minds and into his Last time we had shared a quote from uh, Chuck Swindoll, again, a favorite of mine. Perhaps you've heard him on the radio. He's been around for a, a good many years. I remember started listening to him back in the late 70s as I was a seminary student and uh, working as a contractor for a guy, uh, actually a contractor's helper. Uh, we would tune him in uh, every opportunity that we had. But he has written a book called... Uh, um, you know, getting a grasp on things. And one has to do with attitude. And this is a second major quote that he shares in that book. He says these words. He says, the longer I live, I realize the impact of attitude. Attitude to me is the most important thing. It's more important than facts. It's more important than my past, my education, my money, my circumstances, my failures, my successes, or even what other people think, say, or do. It's more important than my appearance my giftedness, my skill, uh, 
It can make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing about attitude is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude you and I embrace for that day. He goes on to say these words, we cannot change the past. We cannot change the fact that people will act a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The one thing that we can do is this. We can have the choice of attitude. He goes on to say these words, I am convinced, he says, life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. So it is with us in terms of being in charge of our attitudes. Again, as we say goodbye to 2022, uh, we say hello to 2023. Of course, as we look back, 2022, uh, it's had its potholes on the journey of life and the broken places in the road. And uh, uh, if you've uh, driven here in Western Pennsylvania or even West Virginia for that matter, uh, there are a lot of potholes and und undoubtedly you've probably had a, a bent rim or perhaps a broken uh, belt in your tire. Uh, the point being is if you drive on uh, roads here in Western Pennsylvania or e even anywhere in this near proximity, uh, your car probably is in need of an alignment. If it's pulling to the right, or if it's pulling to the left, that's an indicator uh, of something that needs attention, namely probably uh, uh, an alignment. As we think about life, we are in the same place. We, as our cars, certainly need an alignment, especially when it comes to this whole matter uh, of attitude. Now, Paul says these words in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, that really helps us again understand the importance of attitude. Listen to what he says. He prays for the Roman and believers, and he says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude toward each other that Christ Jesus had. Now, I submit to you on the basis of what we read here in Romans chapter 15, Paul says a part of you and I getting to the place of having the, the right kind of attitude or having the realignment of attitude, certainly prayer is a part of that. But the question we want to hopefully try to answer today is simply, uh, what is the mind of Christ? I remember as a new believer, I was on a Bible college campus. I had been a believer just a short period of time. I remember when I went to Appalachian Bridal Institute, I mean Bible Institute, um, the, uh, that was a little bit of humor. It didn't work too well, but anyhow. <laughs> Someone said that, you know, Bible college is sort of like a shoe factory. Uh, you come in as a heel, uh, you get your soles mended, and you go out in pairs. Well, Deb and I were married at Bible college, and I assume it was, in a sense, like uh, a shoe factory in that sense. But anyhow, another little bit of humor, which isn't working, so I'm going to stop with the humor today. So the question was back then on campus, as we uh, were new in our faith there, uh, have the mind of Christ. And I thought, you know, I would love to be able to have the mind of Christ, but how do I get there? How is it that we get out of our mind and into his? That was the real question. And perhaps you're here today and you're thinking, how can I get to the place of indeed having the mind of Christ? Because we are commanded, are we not, in chapter 2, verse 2. Five, let this mind be in you, or let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what is it that makes up the mind of Christ? Insight number one, as we move in that direction, is simply this. Number one, we need to think in terms of unity in contrast to individuality. And that's in essence what we read, especially as we look to chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It's dripping with the concept, the idea of the unity that we have within the context of the body of Christ. Let's pick it up looking at chapter 2, verse 1 in the book of Philippians. It says these words, If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ... If there's any encouragement in Christ, and the conditional sentence here in the original language has the idea, if there is, and there is. If there's any consolation or encouragement of being in Christ, and there is. 
Now you think about being in Christ, what does that mean? There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's certainly an encouragement, is it not? We have security in Christ. We have acceptance in Christ. We have forgiveness in Christ. We are equipped by virtue of our relationship with Christ. In Christ, our sin debt has been canceled, eradicated. Our sins have been... um, He says, I will remember them no more. In other words, he places our sinfulness into the uh, eternal shredder of his eternal forgetfulness. Our relationship with Christ is restored. Our eternity is secure. These are things that are unifying realities that we have as uh, in common as believers And as we look to the next phrase, we see this same emphasis upon unity versus individuality. If there is any consolation of love, are you consoled by the reality that God loves you with an everlasting love? Are you consoled by the fact that his love for you is an inseparable love? Think about that. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he goes through the catalog of just about everything, and he says nothing is able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in uh, the relationship that we have with him. These are things that we have in common, an internal, never-ending, inseparable love. Then he goes on to say these words in verse 1, is there any... um, any fellowship of the Spirit. The word fellowship is the word koinonia. It means joint participation in a common life. We are members of one body. We've been brought into the body of Christ, immersed into the body of Christ by the work of the Spirit of God, the same Spirit. We are given by Him this capacity to love beyond our own human capacity, if you will. And so He's saying, listen, You've been introduced into a, into a body of, of, of caring and sharing. It's a beautiful thing when that is fully operational as we each and every one yield ourselves specifically to the work of the Spirit of God. Now notice what he says in verse 2. He says, make my joy complete by, here it is, being of the same mind. That means a unified mindset, the mind of Christ. We'll talk about again what all is involved in that. Maintaining the same love, united in the, uh, the same spirit, intent on one purpose. So as you look at all these phrases and we put them in to a, 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 uh, a sentence or two, basically what he is saying, listen, We need to begin to think as a body of believers, as a church, as a family or even a church family, we need to think in terms of unity and contrast to individuality. So, as we think about having the mind of Christ, what does it involve? Thinking in terms of unity and contrast to individuality. The second point is this. We need to begin to think in terms of valuing others' interests over our own. Pick it up with me in verses 3 and 4. Perhaps some of the most um, important, although all Scripture is important, these are some of the most important verses in the New Testament. Notice what he says here in verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each, now that means each and every one of us, no one is exempt, regardless of how old you might be in Christ, whether you're a brand new believer or if you've known and walked with Christ for, for a number of years, for decades perhaps, he's saying you're not exempted. Let each of us regard one another as more important than himself. Each one of you, no one's exempted, were to value or esteem one another, here it is, this is the hard part, as more important than himself. Now, if we were to really take serious, we'd need to drive our, our mental uh, our, our mental tin stakes into the soil and, and verse 3 and also verse 4 and really grasp what it is that Paul is trying to get us to understand if we're to move in the direction of having the mind of Christ. Now if we don't get it in verse 3, in essence is what he does in verse 4 is to repeat the very same thoughts and concept that we might get it. If we don't get it in verse 3, he's saying let me give it to you yet again in verse 4. Notice what he says in verse 4. Do not 
not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. This would mean what? We're more interested in promoting others, encouraging others, caring for others than we do for ourselves. How are you doing on that front? That's a tall order, isn't it? Consider others as more important than, than me or you? How do we get there? Obviously, it's a, it's a matter of yieldedness to the Spirit of God. It's a matter of obedience to the Word of God. There's no question about that. But he's saying, listen, you and I, uh, when we come to relating one another, we need to considerably give uh, more attention to being others-centered versus being self-centered. I think I told you as we preach one of our first messages here of a family back um, during the first part of COVID, you call, we got those uh, stimulus checks and I don't think any of us were anticipating those things coming to our address, but lo and behold, they did. And I remember one family was aware of another family whose uh, income stream was interrupted by virtue of the fact of COVID and, and the fact that their um, their income had changed. In other words, the husband's job was no longer producing an income. And so uh, God impressed upon this couple's heart. You know, we weren't anticipating this. We weren't thinking about this. We weren't banking upon this. Therefore, uh, they're in a spot that their income's interrupted and they were moved to give their stimulus check to that family who had had their income stream interrupted. Thinking, as he says here, what? And regarding one another as more important than himself. How are you doing on that? Think about it. Like I say, it's important perhaps to drive a mental uh, tent stake and camp here for just a little bit in our thoughts. And any time God repeats something a second time, it's as if he is saying, listen, I, I, I think you might have the tendency of somehow or another uh, not really getting it. So he repeats it a second time. And that's exactly what he does here in verse four. Don't look merely out. That's the word uh, scope. Don't merely be scoping out how you might care for your own interest, but be interested in scoping out how you might be able to address the interests of others is the idea here here. Being more others-centered than self-centered. Now, when we uh, were born into this world, we came with a hereditary defect, namely the sin nature we've received from Adam. And that's why we tend to be so self-centered. It just comes natural. You don't even have to in any way feed it or promote it or in, encourage it in any way. It just happens because that's part of, of, of that part of us that's not yet made perfect. It will be when we see Christ, but that's yet in the future for those who know and love him. Now, Jesus, now look at verse 4, did not merely look upon his own things, did he? But he looked upon, the with, the, with a heartbreak and a love for us, he looked upon the things that were for others. His own things would have been a, a throne, a crown, a position, a name, a limitless manner of existence there in heaven. But as he looked down upon humanity, mankind, he saw brokenness. He saw condemnation and confusion and depravity and desperation. So as a consequence, what does he do? He exchanges a throne for a stable, a crown for a cross, riches for poverty, again, in the interest of others because he saw us as hopeless and helpless. And so Paul is saying, listen, look at his mind. Look at your mind. Value others' interest above your own, in essence, is what he's saying. Think in terms of valuing others' interests above your own. Think selflessly instead of selfishly. Third piece of, of moving in the direction of having the mind of Christ is simply this. Think in terms of self-sacrifice 
instead of self-service. In other words, well, let's go to, I skipped one, didn't I? Think in terms of denying your rights instead of demanding them. Notice with me verses 5 and 6 and 7. He says, uh, let this attitude, this is mine, be in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Present tense verb form, it's imperative mood, meaning it's a command, meaning it's something that we should think in terms of day in and day out, hour in and hour out. Although Jesus existed, that's an interesting word, it means to be underneath the beginning, meaning Jesus was preexistent, okay? He existed before the beginning of time, before Genesis 1-1. He has existed from the unbegun beginning, if you will, okay? Even though it says he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, something to be held onto or grasped, but emptied himself. How did he empty himself? By taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, he found himself in the appearance of man and humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Thinking in terms of denying rights instead of holding on to our rights. So Jesus had the prerogatives of deity. He never ever emptied himself of deity. This is called the kenosis passage. And uh, the prerogatives of his deity, uh, he set them aside to be made in the likeness of men. He went from the highest of the heights to the lowest uh, place he could imaginely uh, have gone. He stripped himself, again, of all the divine uh, prerogatives and privileges and, and, and position, giving up this environment of constant glory and worship because you and I had an incredible need. It's summarized for us very clearly in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to what it says. It tells us why. But we see, the writer of Hebrews writes, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. That's talking about the incarnation. Made a little lower than the angels, purpose clause, for the suffering of death. That's why he came, for the suffering of death, that he might, by the grace of God, taste death for every man. In other words, he came down to where we are so that someday, one day, you and I might go up to where he is. God made him sin who knew no sin that we might be the righteousness of God in him. So, how do we get there? What's involved in moving in the direction of having the mind of Christ, thinking in terms of unity versus individuality, thinking in terms of valuing other people's interests over and above your own interests, thinking in terms of denying rights instead of insisting upon your rights. Fourthly, in terms of a key and moving in the direction of having the mind of Christ is this, thinking in terms of self sacrifice in contrast to self-service. And again, we see that uh, very clearly in verse 8. Being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon the cross. You see, he, accept, he accepted the servant's place. He entered a sinful world. He adopted a selfless posture and he offered his life as a substitute for sinners, people like you and me. Self-sacrifice rather than self-service. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. When was the last time you thought in terms of self-sacrifice? Think about it. When was the last time you had given thought to self-sacrifice? When was the last time you thought, you know, I'm just going to give them myself for the benefit of somebody, benefit of somebody else, not not expecting anything at all in return. How long has it been since you begin to, to wrestle with those kind of thoughts? Now, now, Jesus could have looked upon his own things, could he not? His throne, the exercise of sovereignty over the created world, his ongoing existence in heaven in a manner likened to that of the Father in the celestial sphere, but he let go of those things. He, he relinquished those things, his elevated position in heaven, in order to become a servant here upon the earth. Self-sacrifice in contrast to self-servants. He went from the highest of the highest to the basement of human debasement to do for what 
for you and me what we can never begin to do for ourselves. Summarized very clearly is the key verse in the book of Luke which says these words, the Son of Man came not, came not to be served, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. So thinking in terms of self-sacrifice rather than self-service. Now, right now, I would guess if we were honest with ourselves and we were honest with, you know, coming together to be instructed, encouraged, exhorted in God's Word, we'd have to say, you know, there's, there's somebody on my radar screen right now that, that really needs a hand, not a hand out, but a hand up. And, and it seems as if, God, you have blessed me with the wherewithal that I could respond to that need. The question is, are you going to move in the direction of having the mind of Christ where you think in terms of self-sacrifice in contrast to self-preservation or self-service. You could say, well, you know, I could pray for them. Keep in mind, you might be the answer to your own prayer at that point, right? Could be. Not merely intercession, but involvement, connection, participation, like they, they did in the book of Acts. Letting go of my grasp on things, sharing with others, whoever it would be that God brings to my mind that might, that might be in need. In need, I should say. Lastly, as we move in terms of the direction of, of the mind of Christ, it's thinking in terms of allowing God, letting God be responsible for the results. Notice what it says in verses 9, 10, and 11. Therefore also God has highly exalted him, that is Christ, and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, here it comes, every knee will bow, uh, who are in heaven and under the earth and on the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's our Christ in his second coming. You see, in his instance, in our instance, servanthood and authenticity leads to kingdom authority. In Christ's economy, the way, the way uh, up is down and the way down is up. Greatness in, in the kingdom of God has nothing to do with how high you might climb, but rather it has a lot to do with how low you might bend. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that in due time he will exalt you. So we see this glorious prospect that you and I have to look forward to. And by the way, this is not the rapture of the church. This is the second coming. And we will be with him in this coming that's described here in verse 11, the return of Christ. And you know, there's so many people out there trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> When is he going to return and, and so on and so forth? Uh, nobody knows the day nor the hour. The Father certainly does. But, but as we think about the return of Christ and, and the fact that he's going to come in this glorious return, uh, the question is not, Lord, how can I figure out exactly when you return? My response should be this. And you'll notice on the bottom of your sheet there. My response should be this, Lord, since I know you will return, since I know you will return, help me to live rightly or to live righteously, either one. Help me to live rightly. Help me to love deeply. Help me to serve selflessly. And may I be found faithful. May I be found faithful upon your return. He's coming again, friend. And your heart's prayer should be that. May I be found faithful in his return for his church. So, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Thinking in terms of unity, in contrast to individuality, valuing the interests of others above valuing my own interests, denying, denying my rights instead of insisting on my rights. Self-sacrifice in contrast to self-service. And lastly, letting God be responsible for the results. Would you bow with me as we pray at this time? Well, friend, um, 
I trust that this is helpful. Let this mind be in you, this attitude, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are so wrapped up so often, and I'm not excluded from this, uh, just thinking about my own agenda, my own things, my own stuff. We need to think in terms of unity instead of individuality. We need to value other people's interests above our own. We need to come to a place of denying our own rights rather than insisting that they be honored or seen or valued. Thinking in terms of self-sacrifice rather than self-service and ultimately allowing God to be responsible for the results. He's coming again, friend. And so in light of his coming, let me just challenge you with the, these closing thoughts. Live rightly. Live rightly. Love deeply. Serve selflessly. And again, make it your heart's prayer that you might be found faithful upon his soon return. God, we thank you for helping us better understand what's involved in having the mind of Christ. And I pray, God, that you'd move each and every one of us by your word and by your spirit in the direction of having the mind of Christ. We know we can't do it on our own. We need the empowerment, the enablement of the Spirit of God. But we have a better idea, Lord, today, having looked at this passage of what it looks like. And so I pray to God that you would move each and every one of us here, assembled here at Abundant Life, in the direction of exhibiting the mind of Christ. And we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen.